They sought to create a new world, fueled by technology. On the night of October 23rd, 2077... That's how it goes. And you don't need to watch all that shit. Basically, a bunch of scientists live on as robots in this secluded valley performing mad science. It ain't that deep. To be honest, the only relevant thing from the presentation I genuinely care to show you is this voice line. In the years before the Great War... And you've heard the whole trailer. But here's the predicament. Interceptors online. This will only sting for a decade. What did you do with the brain? That was the most important part. What do you mean, lost it? We are under siege! Moving us! You will never survive my deadly robo-scorpions, technological terrors, and... Uh, the Think Tank, the collective geniuses of mankind, have much like every girl I've ever dated, left me heartless, brainless, and spineless. Not just do I now have to deal with the lasting trauma of non-consensual cyborgification, they also managed to let Dr. Mobius, a mad, evil scientist, steal my brain. I somehow don't need it to play the game, which is actually canon for my experience with New Vegas. Be warned, intruder! You are in the presence of a mighty think tank of Big Mountain! The collective geniuses of... We! Dr. Klein! A transmission from the Forbidden Zone! Coming right at us! It is I, Dr. Mobius, transmitting from my dome-shaped dome in the Forbidden Zone! A zone that is... Let me just say, man, I fucking love the dialogue in this game. What illogic is this? Keep your filthy penis-tipped feet out of our labs and secrets! And I love this DLC. It's so straightforward with the player. You're not confused about where to go or what to do. Even though Dr. Klein isn't generally prone to trust lobotomites, he still tasks me to go recover my own brain. Uh, okay. I was gonna do that anyways. I pick up every quest, sell the shit I don't need, buy ammo, and enter Big Mountain. Intruder. Then immediately deplete 30 bullets to kill a single enemy, and begin to ponder whether the level suggestion was there for a reason. I wouldn't have long to dwell on it though, as I found myself swarmed with lobotomites. Not my kind, the ones without a sentience chip installed. My only line of defense is abusing the AI pathing, but alas, not every strategy is perfect. My hands were sweating. I felt very pressured, and I have to admit, the rocket launcher at point-blank range was a real gamble. A real 50-50. The great thing about Fallout Combat is that the reward is most often proportional to the difficulty. If a level 12 player manages to purge a small army of level 15 lobotomites, he righteously earned his Proton Axe. What made that acquirement so much more rewarding is that later down the line, I would find myself torn to pieces by the aforementioned Robo Scorpion army. No matter what I do, these things just destroy me. And instead of admitting I couldn't hack it, teleporting out of Big MT, leveling up, getting better gear, and trying again, I think I spent about an hour perfecting my auto spacing because Landing a hit with a Proton Axe disables robots, rendering the Scorpions unable to use their ranged attack. If executed perfectly, you can take on up to three Scorpions at a time without taking damage. Best friend forever. It is quite fucking astounding how many times I forgot that Robo Scorpions blow up after you destroy them. Far too many times have I been crippled when attempting to loot them. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Chronological re reversal. What happened after I slayeth the lobotomites? 
Well, I came upon Higgs Village, meticulously explored the interiors of the various houses, forgot that I came in through a door that looks like a wall, and came upon some weird dog. At the time, I didn't know that this was one of the special wasteland encounters. In fact, I assumed that the extremely overpowered monstrosity was a boss I needed to kill to escape the village. After a hefty waste of my time, I literally just walk out through the front door. I'm not joking, this whole escapade took 40 minutes and at least half of it was fighting the dog or trying to find a way out. I wasn't crisp, my method wasn't streamlined, I wasn't effective, we weren't getting shit done. So it was at this point I began to really use the world map. Oh my god, look, it's quest markers. And you can go there. Which led me to the X8 testing facility. When presented with the moral dilemma of whether or not to splice a robot and a lobotomite, I take one for the team and do what's necessary for science. If you want radical results and you want them fast, you need to be able to take radical action. Boss Man Dings 15 finishes maxing lockpicking and goes back to meeting his new robot friend. What is this strange new world around? What does it hold in store for a dreamer such as myself? Once more, for science! What? I feel like this has happened before! Can't I feel awake for the first time. What is going on? What is this strange new world around? What does it hold in store for a dreamer such as myself? Attempting to chainsaw massacre my fellow man, I discovered that unarmed enemies can loot each other's corpses. I thought my man was just sensibly fleeing, but no, he was reaching for the peace. Now what am I doing here anyways? <clears throat> The X8 institutional tests are a series of grueling tasks and challenges, and before I could complete even the first level, I had to overcome crippling performance issues. Now for whatever reason, throughout this session my FPS consistently dropped to the point of a PowerPoint presentation. I said fuck this shit, turned my computer off and went to bed. When I booted New Vegas the next morning, I was horrified to find that it boots with no audio. Literally, one frame per second, and worst of all, there was a bit of screen tearing. I found a handful of people with my exact problem online, and in every instance it had to do with their audio drivers. Oftentimes, Realtek audio drivers. I decided to nuke mine, with my level of technological ability that's a 50-50 on breaking my computer. Luckily, I won that coin flip. Unfortunately, it didn't fix the game. Redownloading said drivers is a several hour long process, so I decided to just fucking delete half of my audio devices. Now the game runs perfectly. I can no longer use virtual audio cables, but that's par for the course. We compromise, and then it just works. With a stark reminder that the world's real grueling tasks and challenges are not making videos about video games, but rather intense tedium, I undertake the data retrieval tests with a fresh perspective and newfound courage. Oh for fuck's sake! Now the first level is actually pretty straightforward. You gotta handle a few enemies, just make sure not to have bad RNG and get consecutively knocked down by the cyber dogs leading to an unsavory demise. After that comes the advanced test, which is exactly the same but with twice as many cyber dogs. <laughs> After the advanced test, I face the residential cyber dog test. Knowing that I'm against one tough dog, I use my most efficient battle plan. Mash left click with my strongest melee weapon. I don't know how, and I don't know why, but it just works. From Gabe I get phenomenal loot. The Valens Radi Accentuator, a headpiece with health regen and endurance. Also it's this cool cyber halo. I then dug through Gabe's digging spots to uncover an audio sample of the dog's bark. Oh, no science. 
More concerningly, it also summoned a small army of Robo-Scorpions. After taking care of business, we transformed the frequency of the dog spark into an energy wave, which we used to upgrade our gun. Now it can disable force fields. But hold on, it's about to get heavy. To show you just how much content is in this side quest, we're gonna have to jump a little all over the place, so stick with me. We head to the X-13 testing facility, collect a few components and craft a stealth suit. How do you upgrade it? Absolutely. Four stealth tests. Avoid the robots, lasers, Too bad. turrets, proximity mines. Wahoo! <laughs> and I can't even hate on it. This forced me to properly learn aggro ranges and stealth mechanics. Plus, the stealth suit is pretty cool. It auto injects chemicals. It will, however, get outscaled in no time and is therefore pure bait. The hidden gem behind coming here is retrieving the kennel key. This is where chronological goes out the fucking window. Bye bye, bye bye, chronological. <laughs> Six hours later, I resumed this side quest. Remember when I said every quest was unique and fleshed out? Now we do exactly the same thing again, but it's Night Stalkers. After going through trials and tribulations, the final ending of the quest line is, we finish the research, get the DNA Avenger perk. So, 10% more damage to Night Stalkers. Absolutely horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. What's astounding is I didn't need to do any of that shit. All you need is the kennel key. Take care of a few dogs and get the schematics for Fido. It's pronounced Fido. Easily the most insane weapon in the entire expansion. Now have you ever had a dog and thought, man, I wish his body was a machine gun frame. Look no further than the K9000 Cyberdog gun. It rapidly fires 357 Magnum rounds and even has an attached nose to hunt down lobotomites. When upgraded into Fido, you have a fucking powerhouse of a machine gun. Which, mind you, is not a gun you can craft without a gun skill of 75. That's why this is actually me at level 32 in a totally different expansion. But back to Big Mountain. Although the data retrieval was boring filler, I want to give Old World Blues credit. It also has some of the best side content in the entire game. Inside the sink are various utilities and contraptions with damaged personality modules. To repair them, I've searched far and wide for holotapes containing each AI sentience. Meet the crew. <laughs> I am online once again! I am the scourge of all small appliances, and the boogeyman that keeps lesser toasters awake at night! A megalomaniacal toaster with cannibalistic and terroristic tendencies. You bring him other toasters, and he consumes them to become more powerful. Not just murder! I tear them apart and render them down to their base components! Toaster intends to bring modern civilization to ashes. If you choose to be honest and inform him that the end of the world pretty much already happened, he'll slowly start sinking into a deep depression. Really? Well, fuck! That really puts a damper on the Toaster's mood. Much more impressively, he's got weapon schematics. You want some weapon schematics? I can show you some fucking weapon schematics! You want a superheated Saturnite power fist? I can hook that shit up! Until endgame, the superheated Saturnite fist is the best pound for pound boxing glove on the market. As you can imagine, I had to try really hard not just to add montage music there, but you know, if I do it every time, the whole video will just be really predictable. Who am I kidding? Where the fuck was I? Oh, right. You've got Muggy, who for whatever reason wants coffee mugs. You! Hey, you! Yeah, you! Got any mugs? 
Through a process that's never really explained, he transmutes them into glue and empty syringes, which are then provided to the player with no further instructions. Then you've got light switch number one and light switch number two. This is where I get heretical. You see, I run the lady killer perk, allowing for special, flirtatious dialogue with the opposite gender. Oh, well, that's very sweet of you. Maybe one of these nights we can discuss theorems. I conquer light switch number two and make her hit me with the mood lighting. Gives me charisma, speech, and a nose for business. I then, of course, immediately thereafter, go hook up with light switch number one. Hit me with the smart lights. Get me off that dumb shit. You've been seeing the other light switch, haven't you? Am I not enough for you anymore? Exactly. We got a biological research station who's utterly unprofessional when it comes to handling organic matter. All circuits online, ready to receive your seed. Very inappropriate. That being said, I couldn't help but get a little excited every time I left and he told me to hurry back with that seed. There's also the most tormented being, the sink. Oh god, look at you. You're filthy. I suppose you'll want to clean up then. A bacteriophobic sink, utterly disgusted by filth. That's gotta be the worst job on the planet. Look out! Communist! The book shoot. Blank books encourage the reader not to question, but to blindly and zealously accept what's put in front of him. He speaks like a dystopian authority, promising to protect citizens from seditious material. Citizen? That sounds dangerously seditious. By which he means pre-war books. I could draw parallels between the book shoot and real historical figures, but let's just... There's also a jukebox with the personality of a traditional deep south blues musician. Right on, daddy. Let's spin some groove. The catch is that he can't play music and is therefore spiraling into dementia. And finally, an autodoc who's failed every operation he's ever attempted, except boss man's, which was a fluke due to cranial damage. Here's something completely different. I press E 200 times to replenish my health over several minutes. I could hold down the button to heal 30 times faster. I could sleep in a bed to heal instantly. But at 15 hours of gameplay, I just wasn't there yet. I also killed a giant Kazador. That was pretty fucking cool. And whilst we're doing non-chronological jump cuts, let's skip the whole story, and here's when I finally reached the Forbidden Dome. I face the X-42, a giant robo-scorpion, who kills me in but a single hit whilst I barely scratched him with my strongest weapon. After his second dub, I did what any man would have done in my situation. Disagree with the fact that this boss was designed to be fought with a mini-nuke, and instead use extreme intelligence to take a few shots, wait behind a wall for his attack, and repeat. After decimating his creation, I finally stand before Dr. Mobius, who is surprisingly the most rational, grounded character in the game. Would you care for a mentat? If you can look past his mentat addiction and psychotic hallucinations, you'll actually come to find a reasonable, level-headed individual. And does it even want to go back with you? Maybe you should ask it. He'll allow me to reinsert my brain on the premise that my brain consents to it. With my own mortal flesh, I enter a heated argument. Well, well, look who finally dragged themselves in out of the wasteland. I started reeling it in when I pointed out that hormones really aren't that fun without a body. Hmm, I suppose you're right. And eventually convince my brain with the allure of tactile sensation. Well, I suppose you've convinced me well enough. I really love this game. I had to convince my brain to come back inside my head. Unfortunately, the procedure would require Dr. Klein's lab. And I know that if you want radical results and you want them fast, you need to be able to take radical action. So I killed the entire think tank in cold blood. Not because Mobius turned out to be the good guy, but rather because I'm just about ready to be fucking done with this DLC. And also, I'm not doing whatever the fuck it takes to convince them. Reinsert respectively my brain, heart, and spine, then get myself the fuck out of Big Mountain. 
Let me summarize the important parts of the plot, okay? The sink gained access to the Magneto Hydraulics plant and tried to flood the Big Empty in an attempt to scrub the crater clean. Toaster built a fucking blood shrine to itself and continued its psychotic spree. The light switches ended up shagging. The book shield nearly died choking on a paperclip, then adamantly maintained it was a Chinese paperclip, and that the whole thing had been an elaborately orchestrated assassination attempt. Honestly, the main story's stupid. It's everything else that's worthwhile here. Like trying to splice a man and a dog. What would happen? Oh. Uh, I don't know what I expected. But it's time for the inevitable return of chronological storytelling. When attempting to reach the boomers, I find myself bombarded with heavy ordnance artillery. It really is quite an unsafe path one must walk to reach them. On my third or fourth attempt, I made it through with both my neck and legs broken and but a sliver of health. Hold it right there. Don't you move. How the hell did you survive that bombardment? I got a sprint mod. But I had you zeroed in the whole time. Nobody's that fast. What can I say? With mod loader, anything is possible. And that is our story so far. For this last image is our future. To restore the bomber. To fly the open skies in armored safety, running high explosive ordnance upon ignorant savages. This is our destiny. I was surprised to find that the name Boomers refers to their proclivity for explosives. I could certainly find a use for them in the war, but it's an endeavor I'll have to pursue later. You see, I'm starting to formulate a master plan. For now, I pick up the fast travel location and head to Black Mountain. You see, there's a whole lot of invisible super mutants who once got the best of me. That's the problem. You see, I don't forget, and I don't forgive. Having spent a good 15 hours chopping down robo-scorpions and shooting lobotomites, I am at this point starving for enemies to christen my bullets on. And against this encampment of presumably innocent mutants, I continue to preemptively defend myself to my utmost ability. I don't pull my punches. I don't fucking stutter. With streamlined efficiency, I execute this homicide to a point of absolute perfection. And because this game is fucking incredible, I'm proportionally rewarded for my efforts. Now don't go thinking this last enemy was an oversight. I'm telling you, this operation's calculated. That's the obligatory money shot. I then pursue alliances with respectively the White Glove Society, a group of freak cannibalists, the Great Khans, a tribe of Mongol warriors, and the Umertas who run the Gamora Casino, where you can buy experiences of the flesh. And pretty much every other faction that Yes Man would homicide if I didn't vouch for them. Now you might think these are some shady folks to get in bed with, but it's all part of a greater vision. It'll all come together nicely in the future. Possibly the far, far future. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Right now is the time to ascend from a frail postboy to an unstoppable male man. It's time to pursue power armor training. Now here's the thing. I have to be accepted by the Legion of Steel. That would require me to go fix a filtration system for Magnamera. Pretty simple. But you have to understand, he scolded me that one time, and he really shouldn't have fucking crossed me. That's why I'm in the Repcon HQ, not to retrieve spare parts for the filtration system, but to loot power armor from a fallen Legion of Steel soldier. I also come across the Q35 Matter Modulator, thus far my best energy weapon. Notice this, right? Nearly every lock in the game is inside. I have a maxed lock picking skill of 100, except when I'm inside, where it's 95 due to the aforementioned claustrophobia. But that's besides the point. I was gonna oust Elder McNamara and install a new leader, an understanding leader, a leader that sees my vision, a leader who will enact my influence on the world, a man by the name of Edgar Hardin. 
To condemn the elder, we need evidence. So I apply as a computer technician and fix the virus on their network. You actually did it! Then I saw a very easy locked terminal. My hacking skills are unreal in this game. With no hesitation, I click the first word the cursor lands on and get in. Intelligence is what I found in the system. Wisdom is knowing not to hack it in clear view of a high-ranking paladin of the Brotherhood. Over here! I then get high-level security clearance from Harden and access information about the chain that binds, the most sacred, carnal laws the Brotherhood follow. One such law is that an acting leader can't bestow new orders to soldiers without informing their second-in-command. The holotapes I returned from the slain soldiers proves McNamara guilty. This is exactly what I've been looking for. With my help, Harden stabs him in the back. And with my body rising to power, I instantaneously become accepted by his people. Well all but one of his people. Ah, outsider. I've heard that you were instrumental in providing Harden with the evidence to bring against me. Whatever. You gotta dethrone a few militia leaders to make a super soldier. Now, what can I do for you? I wanna join the Brotherhood. Yes. I thought you might. Dub. To truly become a paladin of the Brotherhood, Harden gives me a mission to prove my loyalty. Remember the Van Graffs? I stole their plasma caster a while ago. Well? I've been tasked to kill each and every one of them. And seeing as I had yet to become a capable marksman, I figured I'd adhere to the meta. Seriously, if a bunch of enemies are exiting a building, the most effective course of action is beyond any reasonable doubt to just spam punch with a power glove. It's hefty, powerful, exciting gameplay. After completing my initiation, Harden makes me a Paladin of the Brotherhood and provides me with complimentary power armor training. There, I think you got the hang of it now. But I'm not done. You see, the armor I stole is mediocre, and I somehow accidentally stashed the chest piece somewhere, so I deemed it appropriate to take the Brotherhood for all they had, seeing as they were no longer useful to me. This is why we went dummy hard on pickpocketing. Whilst literally maintaining eye contact, I snatched the Hidden Valley Depot key, maneuver my way through the lower bunkers, and hidden in plain sight, I become the proud owner of military-grade power armor. Then, I stole everything else in the armor, and sold it all back to make the Brotherhood penniless. Another satisfied customer. I'm really starting to grasp Fallout economics, or so I thought. But in retrospect, here's how you actually play the game. When I became a paladin, they gave me a full suit of their armor for free. I didn't notice that. I also wasn't aware of repair costs. One full repair of my armor runs me a staggering 10,000 caps, which is slightly more than I earned selling the brother. Brotherhood? <laughs> I can't fucking speak, man. Which is slightly more than I earned selling the Brotherhood their own entire armory. A competent Fallout player would have known to actively combine duplicate armor and weapons, as it's infinitely more cost efficient than paying for repairs. Bossman, however, is not competent. In the future, his weapons would go on to sporadically break in the middle of combat. If you're wondering about the actual politics of the Brotherhood outside of I have a problem with authority, basically, their entire society is divided by the lockdown. It's a travesty is what it is. This game's from 2010, it's really ahead of its time. But I'm not big on real life references, you know, it really breaks the fourth wall. I wouldn't want to ruin the viewer's immersion. However, in the video game, my good friend Harden is anti-lockdown and corn-fed as they come. Welcome back, my friend. What can I do for you? A man who's not afraid to make a tough choice. A man who can act on instinct. The literal first thing he does as Elder is lift the lockdown, open the borders, and begin to reestablish the Brotherhood as a military presence in the Mojave. But that's enough lore for now. We'll return to these guys later once we get Best Girl as Companion. But for now, I decided to switch it up and pursue some side quests that weren't necessarily faction related. One such quest was gathering a selection of talent for a show at the tops. When talking to a lonesome drifter, it struck me just how deep you can read between the lines in New Vegas dialogue. He mentions that he's from Montana, and for some reason I get to hit him with, wait, you're not 17, are you? No, sir. I'm 28. Why? 
At first, I presumed this meant he was secretly a woman and I was hitting on her. But it's actually just suggesting that Bossman might have been this guy's father due to ludicrous, unprotected activity of the flesh 17 years ago. So not just have I insulted this 28-year-old man by insinuating I'm his fucking father, I now also convince him to pay me for getting him a gig. I suppose it's only right you get a little something for your troubles. What I got in return is a conundrum of a weapon, the mysterious Magnum. Technically, this is like unfathomably stronger than any other weapon I have. It doesn't even come close. Sadly, it plays this tune whenever you holster or unholster it. With my sprint mod, that renders the mysterious Magnum borderline unplayable. But that's enough of this tangent. Other than the lonesome drifter, I also coerced Bruce to be our singer. Oh, please don't kill me. Billy to be the comedian. Last night, some girl was pounding on my door all night. Finally, I had to let her out. What? I take my wife everywhere, but somehow she keeps finding her way back. I did it. I've been in love with the same woman for 17 years. If my wife ever finds out, she'll kill me. No! And Hadrian to be the mandatory ghoul comedian. Yeah! Yeah! No act is complete without one. After going far and wide, I finally return to the Aces Theater to collect my paycheck, much to my dismay. It happens to be smack in the middle of the casino where I executed a massively successful blunt object homicide. And as a result, everyone here hates my guts and tries to kill me on sight. I suck it up and smoke through it, kill everyone in cold blood and said, fuck this escapade, let me do some real shit. I did a lane switch of monumental proportions when I started working with the boomers. Now for them to truly involve me in their secret plan for the war, I first had to become an ally. The first mission I undertook was taking care of a bug problem, which I consider an outstanding opportunity to rave on about the non-linear game design. Oh, non-linear. Fuck yes. <clears throat> you could just go in there, waste a hefty load of bullets on trash level ants and be on your merry way. But a much more rewarding way to experience New Vegas is to actually pay attention to the dialogue. Seek out Loyal and question him about the sonic emitter. Pass either a speech or science check of 50 and it's mine free of charge. Hot damn, you're right! Now why the hell would I kill these ants one by one when I can damn near T-pose on these bitches whilst every mutated bug in a mile radius gets obliterated in a fucking instance? I not just feel an utter sense of satisfaction, but also damn near any percent speedrun the bug stomper challenge. And that's right! Completing challenges unlocks perks. Fuck yeah! I'm not fucking around! How did I live 24 fucking years without discovering world-driven single-player RPGs? Ah! <clears throat> that, sorry, I gotta collect myself. Have some bearing. Speak with a bit of reverence here. It's not time to pop off yet. We'll get there. I see the power's back on. The ants are all dead? Damn fucking straight! Dub, but accepted is not enough. As you'll be able to see on this rep alignment chart, beyond accepted lies liked and idolized. If you've done something to bother affection, they might even embody various other perceptions of you, my favorite of which being wild child. Your wild, seemingly capricious behavior leaves people scratching their heads in confusion and avoiding close contact. It's impossible to become idolized by every faction. You're gonna have to compromise eventually. Luckily, I hadn't stepped on anyone's toes around these parts. So to bridge the gap and become an ally of the boomers, I needed to become idolized. So I make myself useful around Nellis. For example, there was a handful of gravely wounded boomers in need of immediate medical attention. So I lie to the doctor. Well, I don't know actually. And performed the procedure without the suggested medicine skill. Ah! Hold her right there. You had no business treating that man. You may have spared him a lingering death, but that's straight out malpractice. Alright, fair play. You can't win them all. I was then tasked to repair some satellite arrays at Helios 1. At the facility, I encountered Fantastic. Hey man. Who the hell are you? They bring you in to replace me? They're replacing me, aren't they? Once again, I blindly humor all the wacky side characters I find. What I, at the time, had yet to comprehend was that he gave me a quest that leads to the uttermost ultimate endgame weapon. You see, in New Vegas, an endgame weapon isn't a gun. It's the force of an entire fully charged solar array, enough energy to power a city for a week, triangulating your foes for an orbital laser bombardment by a fucking ion cannon in space. <laughs> Thank you.
in due time. I had not the necessary repair skill to fix the panels, but luckily there's hidden secondary stat checks. Due to my finesse for science, I use my knowledge of photovoltaic cells to provide a jank solution, but that's what they get, I'm not exactly paid by the hour. Once I became liked by pretty much everyone but one soldier, Loyal finally let me in on their crazy boomer conspiracy theory. These wacky nutjobs actually believe that by generating ballistic movement through an aerodynamic lift with propulsive thrust, you could aerostatically induce flight in a metal tube. They call this mythos an airplane. So I swim to the bottom of Lake Mead, deploy the ballasts under the wings, get to a safe distance and marvel in awe as the game actually features a lake surface plane float animation. She's crazy. The world is surprisingly animated for a 10 year old game. Afterwards in the hangar you can even see the boomers working on restoring the bomber, which signifies that we've advanced our progress to my desirable result, their unfaltering loyalty. Considering they're cooking up the only functional explosive ordnance aircraft in the world, that brings Bossman one step closer to equilibrium. And then what happened is that, chronologically speaking, right in the middle of everything I just showed you, I extensively explored Vault 34. Huh? It's a point of failure actually, because Vault 34 is much like this video, very toxic. It's here 23 hours in that I have no choice but to familiarize myself with the radiation mechanic. My ignorance of which I'm sure at least a couple nimble Fallout players have compulsively obsessed over throughout this video. Hello? <clears throat> Here's the tea. You gotta cure your radiation poisoning. Completely. By going to a doctor and paying minimum wage for what used to take me about 10 to 15 radaways. Okay. And remember if this doesn't help, Try taking a bath in tomato juice. Then you pay attention to how much radiation you're basking in and appropriately use Rad-X. Taking Rad-X is cool, man. It's rad. If you do it 20 times, it makes you radical. By the way, Dr. Strauss is an entirely incompetent doctor. She's the only one I ever came across who peddles both addictive chems and medical supplies. That's an impressive dealer. She's the problem and the solution. Another satisfied customer. Her dialogue strongly suggests that she has a proclivity for getting high on her own supply. And then after putting herself on edge, she uses medicine to take the edge off. All of this is funded by taking advantage of the sickest, weakest members of society. Based. She would have presumably continued her double boy toy rodeo flesh crusade had I not gunned her down in the street like the degenerate she is. But that's besides the point. Now I think this is Fallout at its best. I'm constantly scavenging for ammo and more radaways so I can explore deeper. This game really shines when approaching an intense combat encounter with limited resources, because it forces you to think and learn the game. No doubt, a very stressful, high-octane situation, which you'll be forced to experience dozens of times whilst hopefully learning, adapting and evolving. There's nothing better than being backed into a corner like a wild fucking animal, cause it leaves you without a choice. They just made themselves the path of least resistance. Mind you, that was only the first floor.
certain scenarios, it's not optimal to use assisted targeting. Whoa. Diverse gameplay. I enter the control room, get the jump scare of my fucking life, and come upon a big red button. Without hesitation, I immediately press it, causing a meltdown, irrevertibly shutting off the vault reactor. Apparently, this helps the NCR with their crop growth. I have no idea how any of this works, and I don't care. Not even a little bit. You see, I'm not exactly here for diplomatic reasons. At this point, Bossman has evolved past diplomacy into a fanatical, irregular military superpower. When such an entity engages in a slaughterous crusade, he is indeed motivated by the journey. But make no mistake, what drives him is the destination. For the ring is where a champion takes his belt, but the gym, the armory, is where he wins it. Enough ammunition to arm an indigenous population. And even if, circumstantially, I may not have an indigenous population on hand, I can sure as hell make do with a sniper rifle, combat shotgun, and most importantly, a missile launcher that in stark contrast to my rocket launcher, does much more damage than early game PP handguns. Now I've shown you guns, and I've shown you ghouls. But I'd also like to take a moment to explain why the guns and ghouls around these parts are so plentiful. And to do that, we have to take a step back. You see, it's a common misconception that what destroyed the world was a nuclear Armageddon. On a purely physical level, I'll concede, technically true. However, nuclear war was not the cause, but rather the effect the end destination of a dark and sinister path which led humanity astray. I'm of course talking about the catalyst, social experiments and technology. You see, it wasn't just Vault 22. All of them were deranged, inhumane experiments in one way or another. And it's one of the things I love about this game. In this one, they decided to overstock the vault with weapons, which gave it a distinct gun-focused culture. They then coupled said culture with democratic capitalism. They favored recreational facilities over the cost of living space, yet had no laws in place to restrict rampant overpopulation. With all this in mind, I have to say, it's an absolute mystery how by the year 2281, feral ghouls with some level of intelligence made up the vast majority of the population. But enough about the United States of America. Let's talk more about Fallout. I got a singular closing statement for Vault 34, and you can consider it a public service announcement. <clears throat> if you ever smell burnt toast in an enclosed space, you're gonna want to momentarily hold off on firing any ignition-based weaponry, because on the off chance that you're not having a stroke or making breakfast, it could be such that you're standing smack in the middle of a highly flammable hydrogen gas leak. If you were to exude kinetic energy, it would exponentially turn into much more kinetic energy. I went to the Hidden Valley and got infected with entheogenic scorpion venom. Right as I began to execute my counterattack, the poison reached my central nervous system, which caused a slight disturbance in my field of vision. Then I came into an altercation with two wild coyotes, which concluded when I made a compromise. I sacrificed two whole bullets out of my inventory, after which I focused focused intensely, for I knew the path before me was linear. I had a road to walk. A lonesome road.